and, and very brown. Notice also I want you to focus on this because there's another butterfly related to this that you might mix up if you're not careful. And that is this area here is brown. There is some scaling of uh, gray or blue here, but basically this is brown. And uh, this area, of course, is all brown. And this air streak is large. The first time I saw this, I could not believe it. I said, what is this big brown butterfly? It's about three centimeters across. And uh, it, it is, for a, for a hair streak, it is really good size. So anyway, uh, this is Johnson's. Now, the one you'll confuse with it, maybe, is this one. Now, if you look at the picture and say, well, wait a second, this is really different from the other one. Yes, it is. Uh, for one thing, you notice that the, uh, the ground color here is much lighter. It's almost like a honey brown. It's not a dark brown at all. This is the cedar hue streak, and it's the larva, of course, feeds on the uh, western red cedar, which is very common up there. So these two butterflies <laughs> fly together because both of the food plants are right there. Uh, and right along this road, you can find them. Uh, either down on the flowers on the on the road itself or uh, mudding in the uh, little ditches along the side of the road there if there's water. So you can find it. This one is much more abundant though. The cedar hair streak, it, it, it's more abundant and it's also smaller. It's about 2.3, maybe 2.5 centimeters across. So it's a much smaller butterfly and much more common. I, the ratio probably 10 to 1, 15 to 1. Uh, 15, 10 of these to ever the Johnson's that you find. Johnson's is much, much uh, rarer butterfly. Then also down this road, you'll see some of our common butterflies as well, which you go up there. Um, the Western Tiger Swallowtail will be flying up and down this road. You will see that. You'll also see the Pale Swallowtail flying up and down the road. These are two of our real common uh, Swallowtail butterflies that will be flying. Now the best time to go up here, I recommend uh, if you want to see the Johnson's hair streak, the very end of May, the very first of June. But be very careful about the Olympic Mountains. Uh, you have no idea how many times I've been up there and been in the clouds. It might be a beautiful, sunny, clear day in Seattle, and you get all the way up here to Lake Cushman and it's cloudy. Uh, the Olympics, for some reason, just don't like to shed clouds. And so make sure you Google the weather very carefully and make sure that, look at forks. If it's clear in forks, you're going to be good. Okay? <laughs> but uh, the, the mountains there, they seem kind of, those clouds can hang in there. But if you get a nice bright day, you'll be rewarded by seeing some of these really nice butterflies. Also, the little common checkered skipper has always been there every time I go. It's there. Usually it's flitting around on, close to the ground on the flowers. And uh, so it, it's quite common up there as well. Also, you'll see uh, the blues up there. The echo blue is very common as well. You'll also see the uh, satyr comma up there as well, and some other real common butterflies. So it isn't just those two hair streaks, but the Johnson hair streak was the reason I sent you up here, because that is the special bug for this area. OK, now that's one trip. And that will take you probably about a half a day. But you can't go on our second trip from there. So it's time to go home and then pick another day to go on our second trip. And the second trip is going to be Mount Townsend Trail near Quilcy. This is one of the most beautiful hikes you can take in the state of Washington. And if none of you have been up there, or if some of you have been up there, you can agree with me that it's just absolutely gorgeous. Um, it's uh, near, you have, you have to go to Quilcy, and uh, from there, uh, you can, can take the road up, and the road is paved most of the way, so it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, road to get up to the trail here. Uh, but this is a full day, and I recommend if you to do this, first of all, Google ahead, make sure that the weather's going to be clear. Because once again, you're dealing with the Eastern Olympics, and the Eastern Olympics are so fickle that you never know what's going to happen there. I was up, in fact, I was in uh, Hoodsport, which is right before our, our of course, before I went north, it was totally clear in Hoodsport. By the time I got up to Quilcene and got up at the end of the trail here, it was cloudy. So uh, you have to really be careful of the weather. But if you catch a really good day, uh, this is a spectacular, absolutely spectacular hike. The last field trip I took with Wapa up there, it rained the whole time. But you know what? We had a great time. The wildflowers were beautiful. And we saw lots of wildflowers, not a single butterfly. <laughs> but we saw lots of wildflowers, and it was nice. And we had almost to the top, in the rain. Now, is that dedication? You better believe it. Okay, so Mount Townsend, how do we get to this? Let's say you want to go here. Well, from Seattle, you probably take the ferry across. 
and a Kingston, and then uh, you want to go across the Hood Canal Bridge, and then you want to you want to uh, go down to Quilcene. You can take the shortcut uh, down uh, to Quilcene. From Quilcene, you go into the ranger station if you want, and get a map if you if you really need one because it's pretty easy to get up here. But if you feel more secure, go into the ranger station. And then about a mile or so down the road is called the Penny Creek Road. And it's right before you get to the bridge. And uh, Penny Creek Road, you want to get to, it's to the right, and you want to go up that road. And that road is paved almost all the way. There are some areas that are graveled. I think they're in the process of repairing it, refinishing it. Uh, so some of it is, uh, is gravel, but most of it is paved all the way. So it's a great road, and you can go way up into the Olympic Center. It's just wonderful. And also, there's a lot of neat butterflies along that road. If you uh, park your car, uh, you would be amazed at what you can, especially in the fall. I was up there in September, uh, and I couldn't believe all the new phallids that were out fresh. You know, uh, they had hatched out in, uh, in September, and they were all along the, the road there. So they, it, it can be really good uh, there as well. But go early. Um, if you're going to make it all the way to the top, and you want to really do this justice, what I'm going to show you, I would suggest you should the trailhead by 8 o'clock in the morning. So that means an early rise here. But if you're not going to do that, you're going to miss because you're not going to see everything. Uh, it's a good hike, uh, but I, you should get there early. It, it, by 8 o'clock would be great, and that would be a good start. Okay, and this is in the National Forest. Now, the reason I like that particularly is uh, they're not so fussy about you taking a net. I know some of you people don't use nets. I do because I like to ID things, and I like to make sure what I'm catching. And uh, the National Park kind of frowns on you having a net, uh, but the, uh, the National Forest is no, no problem. In fact, I talked to a lot of forest people up there, and they're asking what I was doing and looking, and they got all excited about what I was doing. So they were just fine with it. Uh, also, you can get off trail, and it's not a really good idea to tromp around all the wildflowers, but you can get off trail if you need to to see something, whereas the National Park, they're really fussy about that. So. That's some of the advantages of, of going here. Plus, I think you see more of the butterflies at one time in this area than you would like at a hurricane ridge. Here's the Mount Townsend Trail. Now, what you want to do is go to the second trail. If you're going to do this road, there's going to be a sign that says Mount Townsend Trail, the first cutoff. Don't just skip that. Keep going. Uh, because it's going to take you another mile up through the woods from there to get to this trail. <laughs> and if you like woods, and if you like the extra hike, fine, go ahead and do it. But it's an extra mile that you don't need to do because you're going to see the same woods here up to the first meadows. So you can start, your uh, trailhead is at, at 4,030 feet. So you can see you can drive right up to this. You drive up to 4,030 feet. That's pretty good. Uh, it takes a lot of climbing out to start with. Now, this is kind of the lay of the land of the trail. The trail is excellent. It is just an outstanding trail manager. But there's one problem. It's a steady uphill. And uh, the way I always enjoy it is I take in all of the wildflowers on the way. So that way I can pace myself, take it cool, take it easy, get lots of stops, and it's, it works out fine for me. If you're a real avid hiker and want to get from point A to point B, you can just march right up this. But it's a pretty steady uphill through forest, but it's, it's beautiful. Wildflowers along the, the trail, and uh, you're going through an old growth forest. So it's, it's absolutely fantastic. So this is kind of what the trail looks like for the first part of the, <coughs> the hike. Unfortunately, I didn't get this in bloom when I was there, but the uh, Pacific Road of our Washington State plant, grows here, and it's very, it's everywhere. There. <coughs> so one thing nice about the Olympic Peninsula is that's where we find so much of this plant, our state plant. Uh, when it is a bloom, the flowers are kind of pinkish, lavender color. Yes? Do you have a bloom time? The bloom time for that is usually May. May? Yes. Now, up this high, it probably be late May. I'm thinking more, you know, I, I have one of these uh, native plants in my yard. And mine always comes out in May. And uh, so I have this species. But um, I would say up that high, I would you know, probably extend it a couple weeks, maybe uh, towards the end of May, maybe even early in June. Yes. But if you go up early in June, you're going to run into snow up further. So yeah, you'll see flowers here, but you're going to not get the benefit. 
The time to go up to Mount Townsend to do this trail would be, it depends on the year, because this is a high snow year, so I don't know this year, but I would say anywhere from mid-July through August. Uh, and it might be late July. It just depends on the, the snow. You have to kind of check on that. Calling the ranger station at Closing would give you that information. They would tell you whether it snowed in at the top or whatever, and they would definitely give you the information on that. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I do is I check the Washington Trails Association website, check for trip reports, because this is a really popular trail, so there will be trip reports, and they'll say how much snow was on the trail when they were there. Yeah, yeah. I, that's, I'm glad you mentioned how popular this is. Uh, this is not a secret trail. Um, you usually go up there and you run into many, many people and their dogs. They take their dogs up there, the kids, the whole works, they're up here. And uh, so it, it's a wonderful hike, it's just a wonderful hike. But it's a steady uphill, so you have to be in pretty good shape to do this unless you just take it really cool. And if you do that, start even earlier. <laughs> Make sure you can get up there. Now, so along the trail here, now this is along the wooded area. You'll see some nice plants and, and uh, the steward's going to help me out whenever. I, I identify all these plants from the slides, and so sometimes uh, it's easy to make a mistake, and uh, so if, I, if I've made any, uh, then Stuart will help correct me. He's our well, in-house botanist. The Tiarella, I don't know what cordifolia is, but a trifoliatum, a Tiarella trifoliatum would be the name that I know for foam flowers. Okay, this might be an older name for the species name. I think it's East Coast. Is it? Oh, it could be. Okay, that could be. So, uh, so you guys can help me out. That's great. Uh, the star flower, uh, the whirl of uh, leaves around it with a nice little white flower, and then the foam flower all along the trail. You'll see this with the, the heads nodding. And, uh, and the Indian pipe that you'll see along the trail uh, periodically. It ran into this, plus orchids. Uh, but the Indian pipe, as you notice, is, is not does not have chlorophyll. So if it's right, Stuart, they get uh, from the organic material in the soil, is that where they get most of the nutrients? Uh, I, I'm thinking that they're actually getting it from fungi. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. think we used to think we, that they were just decomposing things on their own <coughs> somehow. And it's not as clear as I'd like it to be, but I think these are somehow getting it from fungus, whether it's parasitic on the fungus? No, mycorrhizal associated. Like a kind of mycorrhizal fungus. Yeah. But, but are they giving anything back to the fungus? Yeah. That's yeah. what I don't know if it's yeah. if there's any evidence of it. I think this is a good question. But anyway, the plant is not green, so it's obviously getting its nutrition from the soil somehow. <laughs> oh, more of the hike. So you can see, <laughs> you notice this. It's still going uphill. You notice? <laughs> or downhill. Yeah, we're downhill. It's fun going back. You can almost run down. It's going up. It's so hard. But all along the side, you run into uh, in the, in the plants. Uh, this is the uh, rattlesnake orchid. And uh, it, if you haven't ever seen that, or yeah, it's called rattlesnake planting. I think there's a number of, of different uh, common names. For this. And again, the scientific name you have up there is not the one It's I not correct? Okay. Good year of longifolia. Okay, okay, the species name then is incorrect. Okay, and you've got a nice shot adjacent to that in the brighter green of a, uh, no, a pink pyrola. Pyrola, that's yeah. a pyrola cerefolia. Yeah, the pyrola you don't see a lot of. And the Oregon grape. So, yeah. But anyway, this is kind of interesting. And rattlesnake gets its name from the leaves that look like almost like a snake skin. Idea. And the little wild rose, which you'll find there, the little forest rose, a little delicate little pink one that we have. And uh, also the vanilla leaf. Now, I have an interesting story about the vanilla leaf. I used to teach environmental biology uh, in high school, and uh, I would take my kids on field trips, and I tried to get them to identify as many common plants as they could, plus animals, whatever. And the kids had a terrible time remembering this plant, vanilla. They could not associate with it. And I said, well, now take a look at it. I said, look at the leaves. They look like an elephant's ear. I said, now doesn't this look like an elephant? And they said, yeah, it does. It looks just like an elephant. Well, that was my big mistake, because you know the next field trip what they were calling it, right? <laughs> they called it elephant ear. <laughs> Didn't do any good. OK, and as we... Uh, Meander up through this uh, forest. We uh, we cross a creek here, 
And the reason I took this is to show that there are plenty of little seepage areas, creeks along the trail, and plus the mosses. If any of you are into mosses, this would be a great place. I believe over there I even saw some liverworts in there. So there are a number of species of mosses that would be interesting to some people. And this guy, the slime mold. Everyone seen slime molds before? Has anybody touched the slime mold? What do they slime. feel like? What? Not slimy. Well, I got a story to tell about that. When I was taking systematic botany at, uh, at Western Washington University, um, we, we was mandated that we, we make uh, plant collections in those days. You know, today I think collections out, isn't it, David? They don't do collections anymore. But when I was when I was taking college classes, we had to make collections of all kinds of things. For anyway, for college classes? Yeah, well, classes. they still require collections. Where? They still require. Oh, they do. Okay. So anyway, uh, the professor was by me and uh, Dr. Taylor, and I says, "Oh gosh, that's a slime mold." I says, "I think I can I use this," and he had kind of a smile on his face, and uh, he says, "Sure, you can use it." So I had a baggie with me. Do I need to go any further? With this? <laughs> I put it in a bag and put it in my backpack. Do you know what this thing looked like when I got back? Okay. Anyway, these things move. They move. They move from place to place. And one field trip, we were up in the, uh, with, with my environmental class again. We took a hike and we saw one and we marked it. We marked where it was because we were on about a, a, about a four hour hike. And we hiked up and came back and we had seen that it had moved. We, we had made a line there and it had moved. So, because they didn't believe it, they think, oh, I think that's a move. They actually do, they fall. They move. Okay, this is a cute little lily, a Queen's Cup lily. Uh, and you'll see this along the trail. And this is in the forest now. We're talking still in the forest area. And uh, pretty soon we're going to open up into a totally different uh, ecosystem. And the coral fungus. Coral fungus kind of look, reminds you of coral. Yeah, that grows along the road. And then the Munchberry dogwood. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this or not. This is an herbaceous plant. This is a tiny little thing. Now, it's, it looks exactly like the tree. Exactly like the Pacific dogwood in every detail except size. And it's herbaceous. It's only about six inches to a foot high. Whereas, uh, of course, the trees, uh, dogwood, Pacific dogwood is a, is a large tree. Now, we break out in the forest. We've been in work, uh, right up that trail forever, and then we get into this beautiful subalpine there. Just flowers everywhere. And uh, the trail now will switch back through this about three times. So all along this trail, there'll be butterflies on these flowers, on the leaves, everywhere. Now this is about 2.7 miles, so you've gone that far. Now some people, might say, that's enough, I've had enough hiking, and they might want to just spend the rest of their time here, which is pretty rewarding because there's lots of different butterflies in here. It's a good spot, but I still think you should make it to the top for a number of reasons, which I'll go on later. Anyway, let's take a look at this area. Here's some, the switch, one of the, you can see the trail and switch back there coming through, and uh, there are a number, number, number of plants. We're not going to spend time going through that, otherwise I'll never get through my program tonight, but uh, there are many species of plants there. I just just documented a few of them here. The thimbleberry, um, which you'll see in this meadow, and notice that that was not down below. I did not see that in the forest. It might grow there, but we didn't, I didn't see it. But it's in this open meadow. It's, um, it's pretty common. Uh, the clumbly lily, gorgeous thing. Uh, that is also uh, in this meadow, numerous. And our first butterfly, the Clodius parnassian. Uh, the Clodius parnassian, uh, there's going to be two Barnassians we're going to see on this trip. Now, this is the lower one. This is the one that flies at a lower elevation. So it'll be in these meadows almost exclusively. That's where you're going to see it. And I'll show you uh, by looking at the dorsal surface. You, I want you to just take note of some characteristics here so we'll be able to separate it from the, uh, the one we're going to see on the top of the mountain. Uh, notice that the antennae are going to be solid black. Okay. They're solid black. That's one thing. Secondly, look at this huge area of no scales. This is just membranous wing. No scales at all. So the bite is, is much more limited. Also notice there is no red, even a hint of red, 
and this area in here. Now keep those, keep those in mind. And that will help you dis uh, discover the difference between the Clodius Parnassian and the Parnassian we're going to see on top, which is the non Parnassian. And Sarah's orange tip. And this is the thing that's interesting about Townsend. Sarah's orange tip. Now this was probably, this photo was probably taken in mid-July. Now when does Sarah's orange tip fly? Early spring. Now. <laughs> April. Okay. It's April flying. But that's down here. That's not in the mountains. When you're in the mountains, you've got all of your seasons compressed into a very short period of time. Your spring, summer, and fall are all basically two and a half to three months at most. So everything has to come out at one time. So you might see a Sarah's orange tip, and right next to it would be a fresh red apple, which generally out down here comes out in, what, August or July, late July. <coughs> so they fly together, and uh, that's what you see up there. So all the seasons are kind of compressed together. There's the male, Sarah's orange tip, and then there's the female. I hope I didn't go too fast, sir. I, I know a lot of you people know these butterflies, and so I, I don't like to dwell too much. But for those that don't, the male, if you look at the male, you notice that the orange is, is almost at the very tip end. It's very solid, solid orange, the male. The female, on the other hand, uh, the orange is restricted to a smaller band. And also, oftentimes, it'll be very yellow here. That's, that's very common in the female. So there's the Cirrus orange tip, and that'll be up there. You'll see it if you're up there in July and August, you'll see this butterfly flying in these meadows. Aha! When I looked at this, I said, fritillary food. <laughs> we got violets up here. This is the round leaf, yellow violet. Uh, I assume that's right. I am not so sure. It looks like the oligolabella of the yellow I was, violet. That's what I was thinking about. But the leaves were so round that that, no. <coughs> but I don't know. You might be right. I, I think the uh, also the the uh, flower is uh, on a stalk, a branched stalk. It's hard for me to explain, but pretty sure this is a viola globella yellow stream violet. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was kind of undecided on it. And this one, I didn't even attempt because I didn't take a specimen back. I'm just calling it lupin. But this lupin, uh, this particular kind of lupin, is really common in these meadows. And of course, these are the blues. These are the blues uh, larva food plant. So, so we'll see some blues there. Yeah, and, you got a, and there's a vetch down here too. I think that's a Vici americana. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I didn't photograph all of them here because the whole program would be wildflowers <coughs> uh, because there's so many of them. But if you want to see them yourself, you go up there. Believe me, you can enjoy yourself with all the wildflowers here. It's just uh, plenty of them. Ah, the Mariposa copper is up here. And uh, so that's pretty common. You'll find that real commonly in these meadows. There's the male. The male uh, uh, is uh, brown on, on top. But the female has a sexual dimorphism and has a lot of red in it. And so, or orange. And uh, so they are really quite different looking. Uh, but they're still, uh, the ventral surfaces are the same. So you can identify them. Then, once again, we saw the lupin over, so we knew there's going to be blues. And uh, so here's the silvery blue. Now, those of you who have trouble with the blues, the silvery blue is pretty easy. I think most of you know that there's a lot of trips we've pointed out many times, but you have these uh, spots here making a pretty straight line all the way down. And notice, notice the margin is immaculate. A lot of the blues have, uh, have markings here, you know, all different kinds of. Uh, marginal markings, uh, but the silvery blue doesn't. It, uh, it just has this nice row of nice spots all the way down, and it's pretty immaculate. There's a few spots here, but, uh, but that, that's how you know it. And plus, of course, when you see the dorsal surface, you see how silvery it is. It's not, some blues are very dark blue. This is very silvery blue, so it's, it's well named. It's a good common name. Were they nectaring on those, uh, I believe, penstemons, or were they just perching? Uh, his perching. This was just perching. Some of them, it was a very nice day, and it was in the morning. Remember, I started out really early on this trip, and so a lot of them, a lot of the butterflies were out just kind of sitting, and uh, which made it nice. Oh, and of course, the asters. And uh, don't, even, don't even begin to ask me the species of this. But uh, uh, there are many different asters that are in this area uh, that you will see, and plus the, uh, the pestle. Which is 
So, yeah, oh, and also, yeah, I have another picture of these later, but uh, see them too. So like I said, you could, you, we could make a whole talk tonight just on the wildflowers of this meadow. But we got other things to see and do. Another violet? Oh, fritillaries. Okay. Another violet. Is this correct? The dog violet? Is that it is a violet. I can't say I'm sure from this without seeing the couch. Yeah. And even then, I'm not sure I'd get it for certain. I'm yeah. guessing a dunk up, but I'm not certain. Yeah. And the other blue we're going to see up here is waterfall blue, and this is an interesting blue because the subspecies of this is black wine. And this is not flying in eastern Washington. A lot of we've been on a lot of trips in eastern Washington. We've seen waterfalls blue, lots of them over there. That's a different subspecies than this. Black moray is actually called a Puget blue. This blue is uh, found in um, in our, our Puget areas, like down by Fort Lewis and McCord and that area down there, all the way down to Tenino uh, in June. It's a good time to see that. But it also flies up mountains. So this is another place to see it. But if you want to see it locally, uh, you can go to Johnson's Prairie in uh, June and uh, you'll see this butterfly right there in Fort Lewis. Oh, I got to go back. Does everybody understand why it's a volatile blue? Now, some of you, I know so many people are new and you'll say, how do I know what this is? Uh, you see, uh, this is not a very good shot of the ventral, but you see these spots here? These are ringed. There's a black dot, but they're ringed in white. See that? That's usually kind of a telltale way to, to see the bottles. Usually they're, they're ringed with white. Right. So that, that's one good way. And also the blue is more blue. You notice it's not silvery like the other. And our first fritillary. This is another interesting fritillary because this is also in the Puget Prairies. This is uh, around uh, Fort Lewis as well, but you're going to see this in, uh, in August and September down in Fort Lewis, but you can actually see this up in the Olympics uh, in July and August up there. And this is the Zerini Fritillaria, very dark color as you can see. It's a gorgeous thing from, from the natural uh, side. Sitka Valeria. Dark colors in here. Pardon? That other one, Sitka Valeria. Yeah, I think that's one. I'm not sure. It's not sure that is. Here's the uh, female of this butterfly. It's on the soil, the dorsal surface of it. And these are pretty large. These fritillaries are, of course, greater fritillaries, so they're pretty good size wings. Maybe. Then we uh, also find in this meadow the Baloria, which are the smaller, the lesser fritillaries. And uh, this is the western metal fritillary. And uh, how you can recognize this is especially with a freshman. Look at this nice lavender, marginal inch here. Very nice, large lavender inch. That's very characteristic of this butterfly. When it's fresh, when it's been out a while, then that kind of fades away. And we'll see the, uh, the dorsal surface of that. The Western Mountain Fritillary. And the glacier lilies are here, and of course, uh, I didn't see any animals <coughs> They're very similar to this, except white. But uh, this glacier blue was, was here, other places. And another butterfly, this is a crescent. Now, this is the dark crescent. This is our very darkest of all of our crescents. It has so much black in it that it's pretty easy to, to uh, identify. Plus, it's the one that usually flies in mountain meadows. This is what you're usually going to find when you get up into the mountains. It's a field crescent. This is the male, which has a lot of black on it. The female is quite different. Uh, it's got more orange on it. Uh, this one could be a little bit older too, is because the black is, is much more faded. But you can see that the orange is a lot more sensitive, and it's a little bit larger. Another rhododendron, the white rhododendron, which is along the trail there. And then the Edis checker spots. Now, can someone review for me how we know that's an Edis checker spot from the mental surface? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Uh, we know. Go ahead. Well, there's, uh, okay, look at the hind wing. Yeah. And you can see a row of dark and then white and then a line and then there's orange and then a line and then more orange. That's right. It's now, some of the others, especially down there, other um, checker spots. It, that's called the 
there's orange on both sides of that. <laughs> See that line there, the dark line? There's orange on both sides. Mm -hmm. The other traffic spots it, don't have that. They have some more. And it works great for our state. I understand in other parts of the country it doesn't, it doesn't hold, work. Uh -huh. but it does for our state. All the use checker spots in our state <laughs> all have that double red area. So that's something to keep in mind. It's this area right in here. Yeah. Also, there's another way too uh, that I can, I, 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 I don't know, maybe it's just because I've dealt with them so often. I find that the, uh, the red bands on these are so organized on the Edis checker. This is a male now. And uh, you see, see how these red bands are just all organized and complete all the way through. And the bands seem to be just put in the right spot. In other words, they're, they're just placed where they should be. Uh, here's the female, you can even see that better. You see how all of these um, spots go together and they seem to form a nice pattern here. This is very typical of the Edis checker spot. And uh, this subspecies is Colonia, which flies in the Olympics, and it also flies in the, the Cascades. So you can see it up there as well. It, uh, you can find this up at uh, Mount Rainier. And Dare I ask how you know it's Colonia? Pardon? Dare I ask how you know it's Colonia? Well, it, because it's the only recorded uh, species of Edith that has been found in Western Washington. So if it's not Colonia, we don't know. What about Taylor <coughs> <laughs> You know, you're asking a good question there, and I need to, to spend a second on this. Uh, Ann Potter called me two summers ago and said, how about going up to uh, Mount Townsend and collecting me some specimens of colonial? And I said, sure, I'll do that, Ann. So she sent me a bunch of folders, and uh, I said, yeah, I'll go up there. Well, I went up there, and I, I went three times up there, and I didn't see one. It was just one of those things. It was a fluke thing, because this butterfly is not uncommon. I didn't see one, so I had none for her, and I told her, I said, I'm sorry, I zeroed out. I spent three different days up here, I didn't have any, and I didn't go up this last year. I think she was afraid to ask me after my disappointment. Um, but her purpose was to do, they wanted to do a DNA study with to see whether it is really Taylor. Good question. So I did but a, for now, we call it Colonia. <laughs> What's I, mean, I, I did a survey for her in an area with presumably a lot of Taylor, right? Uh -huh. I can't say I remember how I would have distinguished them. I think it'd be very difficult. And I can't say I know that yeah. they were ever identified correctly. Yeah, yeah, I would. Uh, I would say it'd be very difficult. So that, that's a good academic question that needs to be solved through DNA studies. Okay, let's move on. Quickly, we're going to move up to the mountaintop, uh, Rainfalls Hill uh, and we're seeing the uh, Horikama, which is up here. There's uh, uh, lots of food plant for it along the way. This is the ventral surface, the male dorsal surface of this. Martian variable, I'm not sure about this either. I, I really debated with this. I wasn't positive. It looks like a ranunculus, but I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, that, was, that can be debated. Uh, California tortoise shell. Um, some years this is very abundant up there, and some years it's very rare. Um, last year I didn't see any. This was taken from a past year. Uh, in fact, one year it was so abundant that when I was up there, I was sweating so bad that I have. Uh, California tortoise shells landing on me <laughs> and getting the salt from my skin. That's how abundant they were. They were just everywhere. So this butterfly is, is strange. It, it sometimes is large, sometimes it's attached. You don't see it at all. Ray Admiral. And uh, this, this is another special butterfly up here, the Biddler's Alpine, which is found in the Olympics and also in the North Cascades. And it gets, it gets partly into the, uh, in the high Okanagan as well. Um, but it, uh, it's an interesting one. It's different from our common alpine because of this nice big gray spot here that it has, or bluish scaling. And also, if you look at the, uh, the dorsal surface, you'll notice that down here, this band kind of unifies. This orange band comes all together. In the common uh, alpine, those are individual spots. Those are definite individual spots. So, so they're totally different looking when you compare the two together. But this is our uh, Olympic alpine. 
Now, we're getting towards the top. We got out of those meadows finally, and we're walking our way up here, and we're looking now, and now we're starting to see the Olympic Mountains at the top, seeing the beautiful snow. This is the scenery you're going to see. And uh, whoop, we're running into new plants. Now we find new plants. Uh, Phacelia, uh, also more and more and more and more asters of different kinds. And we get our first view of Mount Rainier from the top of the Townsend Trail. And uh, sorry, it wasn't a really clear day. I've seen, I've seen it so clear that I could see the space needle in Seattle. But uh, this particular day, you could see there was some haze there. But there's Mount Rainier. But you just take a little look over, and you see Mount Baker. And uh, this is all from the trail. This is some of the scenery you'll see. And Glacier Peak. So you can see along the whole Cascades. I could, uh, one day I was up there, it was so clear, I could see all the way down to Mount St. Helens. And all the way up, and I, and I went to the other end of Mount Towns, and I could see the San Juan Islands. So it's very beautiful at the top. Now, here we're at the top now. We made it 3.2 miles from the trailhead. 6,278 feet high. That's where you are. That's where you climb. Okay? And now look at the views. Now you're looking into the west and look at how beautiful those little big mountains are. With all the snow fields. Just gorgeous. This is the top of Mount Town. This is the uh, peak, uh, which is uh, 6,278 feet. And uh, it's really interesting. I know it's the peak because our hilltoppers are there. All, all of you know what hill hilltoppers are, don't you? There are special butterflies that like to find the very highest place to be. And that's where they'll be. And there's two of them here, and I'll show you. Because I went right up there, and sure enough, both of them were there. I expected to see them, and they were there. But uh, that area is full of meadows, of grass, and everything. And this is an interesting plant. Now, this is on top. So let's see the vegetation changes now. We got a totally different ecosystem up here. This is cushioned buckwheat. And this plant is the only plant that this special butterfly up here feeds on. This is the lupin blue, but this is a subspecies that is not found in eastern Washington. This is only found in the Olympics. And uh, this is the male. And there underneath you can see the beautiful, beautiful scale you see, uh, that it has here. And uh, here's the female. And it, it feeds on that food plant. It's the only only place to get. So this you'll only find this butterfly up in the Olympics. And of course, once we see this, we know what else we're going to see. Once we see see them, we're going to see this. Now there's your mountain Parnassian. Now remember, I told you. Remember about the other Parnassian? What did I tell you? Remember? The antenna. The antenna. Can you see the little stripes on here? You go on the next picture. This one isn't as good. That's striped. The other one was solid. Notice a hint of orange. Red up here. See the hint? Well, you'll see it better in the females. The male doesn't display it as well. Notice that this area of just membrane is very restricted now. It's almost all white scaling. And, of course, this butterfly flies on top. And it's a very fast flyer. There's the females. Now you can see the characteristics better. Red. Look at the striped antennae. Isn't okay. this a gorgeous butterfly? This is our mountain Parnassian. Sometimes we just call it the Olympian Parnassian because of its uh, subspecies name, Olympianus. This only flies in the Olympic Mountains, this particular butterfly. Is it not the, no, the ones that fly in the Cascades, it's a different subspecies? Yeah, it's a different subspecies than that. This one only flies in the, uh, in the Olympics. Oh, and also we see Lomatia, and that means there's another butterfly up here. And guess what? It's our hilltopper. <laughs> Are you surprised? <laughs> yeah? What Lomatia was that? Oh, I, let's, go, let's go back. Did I even identify it? You listed as Martindale. I don't disagree. Martindale. You don't disagree? <laughs> I don't disagree. And looking at the leaves, I got I'm, right. seeing, I'm seeing that. Uh, Blush, the, the glaucous look that and the size tells me pretty sure it's Martindale like as you said. Okay. Thank you. So it makes me feel better. <laughs> but anyway, this is a hilltopper. You go right to the very top of towns and I'll guarantee you, you get up there, it's a sunny day, you'll see it. It'll be there. It's there all the time. Every time I've been up there, it's been there. 
and the Anna Swallowtail. And the other hilltopper is the Western Pike. It'll be up there too. You'll see a white butterfly flying all around, just, just around the very top of it. That's it. That's the Western Pike. And there's the ventral surface of it. A plant I didn't even attempt to identify. Sorry. I have no clue. But this is up on top. I identified by the leaves. And I don't see, I don't recognize it. Yeah, I don't either. I didn't know, I couldn't, I couldn't identify. The Arctic blue, now this is another place to find it. This is another special blue that flies in our high mountains. You find it in the Olympics and you'll also find it in the North Cascades. And uh, it gets, I think, in, in the Okanagan partway. At least these parts of the Okanagan will have this too. Beautiful blue. Look at how it has, you know, you might say, oh, it's a water ball, a water ball, you know, blue. It does have uh, ring spots. But look at this brown color. It's brown. It's brown. It's not, it's not a typical blue. And look at the dorsal surface. This is the male. It has blue scaling, but not a lot. It's really quite a dark butterfly. And the female is even darker yet. So, so this is uh, that. Uh, sing to foil. People look at this and say, oh, look at the cluster of buttercups. Well, not so fast. And uh, different family. <laughs> but anyway, it's an interesting plant. And it flies, or it grows up here in this area. This is the peak now, Council. So there's lots of wildflowers. Scarlet paintbrush. And you've got your uh, bluebells of Scotland. That's a, that's a, that is probably specific to the Olympics, too. This particular, this particular one? Is a little I'm not surprised. And this is quite, quite a bit of the I don't know, but this particular one, I think, is specific. Only this species is widespread. Now, here's another checker spot. Now, this one, notice, isn't the Edis. This is a snowberry. And I want you to look once again at for our Edis. Mark, do we have that here? Do we have red on red? No, uh, we have white on white, but we don't have red on red. And so this is the other species. So this is the uh, snowberry shepherd spot. This used to be called. Pardon? Oh, it used to be called instead of. Uh, no, it's. I think it's been called. This be calcidon. The calcid, yeah, the calcidon. Uh, because it used to be called calcidon. Now it's been changed to cold. But it was calcium. Now, another thing is look at the dorsal surface of this one compared to the other one we showed. The Edis, remember how much red was on it and how organized the red spots are? Look at this thing, it's almost all black. So it's much darker butterfly. The Melbourne's tortoise seal we'll see on top as well. It'll be flitting around up there. And also the Hidaspe fridlari, another fridlari that's very common. I want you to show you this subspecies. Rhodope, which flies in the western part of our state. Notice uh, here, notice that this brown color goes all the way through. There's no band here. When you get into eastern Washington, the other subspecies that you have there will have a nice uh, band here of a different color. And uh, so it's pretty easy to tell these apart. Rhodope is usually pretty solid all the way through. And this flies once again in the Olympics. Then the Arctic Fritillary, uh, which also flies in the Cascades. Uh, <coughs> the same Rainier Hive, because you can get it at Mount Rainier. And uh, it's, uh, it's really checkered. It's, uh, it's different in that it's got such a checkered uh, ventral wing there. And that's the dorsal wing of it. And we're down to the last few slides here. This is the uh, Crixus Arctic. This is also found only in the Olympics. This subspecies is found only in the Olympics. Uh, this is the, the ventral surface of it. Here's the male. And here is the female. And these are pretty large butterflies. They're grass feeders, so they're going to be in the grassy area. You're welcome in the grass, you see those. <laughs> then uh, the western sulfur, that's our only sulfur that flies in the, in the uh, Olympics. And, uh, oops. Is the dorsal surface of that butterfly. Then some skippers. And uh, this is dedicated to Richard. We're going to have some skippers that, uh, that we can have for him to see. And this is a common granite skipper. The, the granite skipper is our high mountain skippers. We have uh, subspecies in eastern Washington and one in western Washington. This is our western Washington one. 
health plan. And um, this you'll have better luck seeing if you go later in the summer. You may not see it if you're there in July. It may be August or even into September before this shows up. It's a late, later flying skipper. There's the ventral surface. Notice the white area here. The spots, white or silver spots here. And we'll compare it to the other skipper. There's two skippers that fly up there. The other one is this one, woodland skipper. Oh boy, that's an odd. That's really a rare one, isn't it? That's in your yard. You just want your yard to see this in the fall. And uh, it also flies with it. But it, if you notice the, the coloration here, these are very pale the spots here. So it's it, it, very easy to tell from the random skipper. And there's the dorsal surface of that. And we'll end with uh, spreading flocks. Beautiful plant that we'll see on the, uh, at the top. And look at this thing. Isn't this a gorgeous thing? That's the one I was thinking of. Oh, you're thinking of this one. Yeah, one flower. It has one little flower. And it's pretty small. I had to get pretty close to get this shot. Isn't that a gorgeous thing? And I don't know. Is that the only is that the one place it's found? That's the one I think in one of my Okay, good. It's just a gorgeous flower. But this is right on top. This is on top of Townsend now. You'll find this. Where is it? Campanula piper. Yeah. The piper yeah. is Olympic, what makes it. The Olympic unique. bill flower. Yeah. Yes. It is. It's just a gorgeous, but it's tiny. It's a tiny little thing, but it's just gorgeous. Single flower. Yeah. Any questions? Wow. No. <laughs> Everyone wants to go home. We want to go now. We want to go now. Oh, you want to go now? Yeah. When's your next trip? Yeah. I know. I I go at least once a year. Yeah. The reason for the separate subspecies in the Olympics from the rest of the state uh, due to glaciation. I think it's uh, it's it's been uh, isolated for so, such a long period of time that there's it's a it's an intergreening population and it's just now distinct. Uh, other than that, I don't know. I haven't really gone into the records to find out why this particular differences, but. Um, but, but those that have classified as such have said that it's an isolated thing. The Olympic Mountains are a very isolated area, and you know it's it's really difficult to get from there to eastern Washington. So, but there are some butterflies that span it, like the uh, the Vitter's Alpine. It's in the Olympics, but it also gets into the North Cascades. So somehow, it's made its um, you know extension through the north part of the Cascades as well. And so it's strange, but this one pretty much stays. Any other questions? Yes, sir. How much difference does it have to be, how much different, to be considered a different species? This is a problem. <laughs> oh, are you opening Pandora's box? There are what we call lumpers and splitters in the biology world. Now, there are some people who would like to do away with all subspecies and say, forget it, call it a species, and be happy. Just say, it, just say it's a difference form of the species, and they may be right. But a lot of entomologists like to be specific. And so they make these subspecies names. Um, now, since they're a subspecies, they can technically interbreed. It's, it's only supposed to be species that can't interbreed. But subspecies can. So I imagine you could take uh, a mountain Parnassian from, let's say, eastern Washington, and you could mate it with uh, an Olympic Parnassian. Supposedly, I don't know if everyone's ever tried it, it's been done, but supposedly it's, it can be done. But uh, yeah, you, you've opened a really good question and it's been debated by, I know when I was in biology, uh, it was debated by every professor I had about subspecies. They said, what do we do with it? You know, and a lot of times subspecies are for convenience. You know, it, if you've got an isolated population somewhere and it, it looks at least so isolated, it doesn't look like you have a connection physically with another population, we'll call it a subspecies. So a lot of times it's, it's that, it's just that. Other times uh, they have really good reason. I mean, they have specific differences in them. Like that lupin blue that I showed you up there, uh, if you look at a specimen from eastern Washington and one from up here in the Olympics, they are different. They are different looking butterflies, even though they have a lot of the same characteristics. So, you can justify that one a lot better than you can some of the others. So I think it really varies species by species, but very, very good question. And a very hard one to answer. 
Other questions? How many want to go on the hike? <laughs> it's a beautiful place to hike. You guys got to go on it. Yeah.